We continue to comb through Mitch Kupchak audio. He spoke on Miles Bridges. Then we move on to the head coach, Steve Clifford. What did he have to say about the season? We'll talk about all of that today on Locked On Hornets. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by eBay. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for uh, parts of, so excuse me. So for parts that Mm -hmm. fit, head to eBay Motors and look (laughs) for the green check. Thank you for helping. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. What I do love about my producer, the job that is supposed to make the show and everybody a lot better, enhance, kind of like a LaMelo ball, if you will. Doug does a great job at doing that for me by interrupting me. If I do have a flub, you do make sure to point it out, and I appreciate Mm -hmm. that about you. Doug Branson, EveryHornetsBoxScore.com curator. I'll also point out that we've been combing through this audio for several episodes now. You you like you like to go to the comb as your uh, metaphor of choice. Yeah, no, and I appreciate you pointing that out too. It's all very good. Um, what happens is we have three. Sa- just to give you a little peek Coming. behind the curtain as well. What happens is, and I, and I kid you not, with some of the time lapses here, I'll say, okay, I'm ready to go. Doug will say with the cold open, okay, three, two, one. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh God, uh, what so do I say? You're ready. What, what do I say? You, you're right. So I, I do need to very much be purposeful with the I'm ready. So yes, I, I, I do say combing through. We're going through it. We're listening to more audio. You know, everybody's a critic, including your own producer. I'm Walker Mail, by the way. You can hear me comb through all right. sorts of sports topics on WFNZ from 12 to 3 every single weekday. Let's go to the Mitch Kupchak soundbite. He spoke on Miles Bridges. A very, very long process, and it looks like now, not only does it look like, it is going into next season with the offseason where Mitch Kupchak kind of detailed how, one, there's still nothing available as far as the NBA investigation goes. Okay, So nothing, we don't have anything on that front yet, but Mitch Kupchak did speak about how it will affect this offseason. Here's the full quote. The NBA is conducting an investigation, um, and in and that's the status of the situation right now. There's really not an update, right? It hasn't changed. So, you know, e- even when they complete their investigation, you know, there, there are going to be steps that that need to be taken, whether it's, you know, from us or other teams, right? Because it looks like for certain that this is now going to go over to July 1st, you know, there was maybe not hope or concern. Maybe there was some thought that somebody, whether it was us or somebody else, may sign him during the season. Well, that's not possible. So this 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 whole issue, you know, will roll over to July first. So that's a big deal. Rolling over to July first means not only is this going to affect the first off season, the day before free agency when the arrest happened, right? Not only does it affect that free agency where you have a big old decision, plenty of big decisions to make in a very short amount of time with your lack of being prepared, because who could be prepared for this? That's always been a defense. It's always been realistic defense for them, where you could say this is something that you did not see coming and it's not the Hornets fault. Still, you could criticize them for not doing anything except for bringing back Cody Martin at that time. And that was only a re-signing. It wasn't some external addition. And then you get DSJ and Teo Maladon, you know, falling into your lap, essentially, right before the regular season starts. Doug, you mentioned it yesterday. You know, now we're talking about this Miles Bridges situation affecting the Charlotte Hornets going into a second off season, July 1st. I, I don't remember the date of the arrest, but to, for this to have not been resolved as far as league matters are concerned within a full calendar's year worth of time, mm-hmm. I am surprised that the, the league hasn't resolved something, right? I know how long the trial process can be, but man, a full calendar year, it's, it's pretty long and I didn't expect this to happen. 
Yeah, I don't know when the actual arrest was, but we got the right. news several, maybe a day or several days before the draft, which is typically at the end of June, probably was around the June 20th date. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's that's when the news landed. Uh, yeah, this would be uh, very disheartening if it freezes a second straight offseason. And the reason it's disheartening, Walker, is because it didn't have to. It didn't have to freeze the first offseason. The Hornets could have chosen uh, to to completely move on and pursue other priorities. <clears throat> but instead, they bet on uh, this investigation wrapping up with some kind of time frame that maybe made sense for other situations. And uh, they thought they could have, I mean, according to Mitch there, they thought they could have gotten resolved in season. Uh, but now it, it won't be. Uh, you know, it's interesting I read some comments, sort of some analysis of his interview here as saying like that Miles Bridges' future with Charlotte is still uncertain. But honestly, like I what I gathered from all of this is it's pretty certain they're going to pursue him very aggressively. Uh, and you know, some other teams might get involved, but ultimately the the difficult situation that the Hornets are in now, is that by not pursuing other opportunities in the offseason, they really have invested time and attention into Miles Bridges by by just virtue of the fact that they haven't done anything else. And now it feels like you're kind of forced. A little bit of your leverage is gone, right? Because Miles is, and his team know that the Hornets uh, have lost all this opportunity and to come away with nothing at this point would be pretty devastating. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how aggressive it is, but I read the same thing you do, Doug, about the Hornets, because it was funny when Mitch Kupchak would speak in that quote you just played. He was talking and he would say, whether it be us or another team, it was almost like he needed to mention that and he would forget. Oh, wait, what? Another team can do it as well. And I know he's just covering his bases there. But it but is it does, true because he's a restricted free yeah, agent. So another team right. could come along and say, no. you know, to hell with it. We're going to take the risk and give him a full max contract. Like, I don't think that's very likely, but it could happen. And then at that point, if you're the Hornets, do you, do you match that? Do you say, all right, we're good. We've again, that's where I'd say that what's disappointing about this is that all of their leverage seems to be gone because now if you walk away from that uh, for financial reasons, or just by virtue of the fact that it would be super risky to put the, to invest that much money in a player that has had this many problems already, then and the PR blowback that you're going to get. But if you walk away, you've wasted two off seasons on this. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah. And the, the leverage will be I think the leverage still has to play out because I don't know how many games Miles is going to get. If you're suspended another, say, year on top of the year you've already missed, then that will certainly help charlotte or another team if they view it as a benefit to them which is gross but to then at that point you're different. talking about bringing back a player that hasn't seen the floor in two years no i know but that, like, that that's means significant that be... that's a significant even if he's training and working out with other players yeah. having missed two years it, it would be to you know then you're talking about like what do you what's the number on that What's a, what's the what's a dollar figure on a player that hasn't seen the floor in two years? That's right. That's interesting. Right. I'm speaking to the Hornets leverage part of things, right? Like that to what you just said. That's also another point in the Hornets leverage side of things where now you're saying, OK, now you're going to miss time. Now you're talking about coming back. We haven't seen you play on an NBA court, right? Like if we're just talking about the leverage stuff. But regardless, when you're discussing the ability for the Hornets to bring him back, the question th- that is the question. Do you just move on? Even if you want to view this from a real cynical standpoint, it might behoove the Hornets to move on from a basketball standpoint. You know, morals as well. We've talked about how we would move on. You and I have both said that. Mm -hmm. But if you're just talking about this from a basketball standpoint, Doug, now things have changed a little bit too, right? Because P.J. Washington is closer to that $20 million a year value than he was at the beginning. So he bet on himself and people praise the Hornets for not giving in, right? Which is fine. You know, that could be hit or miss. And it's not like the Hornets greatly missed on it. It's not like he's going to get, you know, this. Honestly, he's he didn't make the Miles Bridges jump, to be fair, but he still made a jump. And so now you're going to pay him close to $20 million annually. Then you get some cap space to work with to go get some veterans and external help. 
And I don't know if people saw this J.R. Smith clip with J.J. Reddick on his podcast, but J.R. Smith talked about the difference between playing for all these tanking teams at the beginning of his career mm-hmm. to actually going to some teams legitimately trying to play in the play, in, in the postseason and mm-hmm. veterans really helping him do that. And so now if you're the Hornets, can you go out and get real leadership-style veterans where they're not – you know, they're coming in and they're contributing, but that allows Lamella to be a leader, but also it allows you to have some of these vets, I don't know, 28, just whatever kind of new additions that you would have for the squad. So there, that way you can save money that way. Like, look, Miles Bridge is clearly a good player. We saw what happened last year, but I don't want this to freeze the Hornets, as you've said a couple of times for a second straight off season. And at some point it just benefits you to move on from that mess. That is this entire Miles Bridges arrest. Miles Bridges was the leading scorer and the leading rebounder for this team, but I don't know that you would classify him as adding much on the leadership front because it's easy to forget, but because of everything that happened around the domestic violence charges. But before that, when we were talking about how much the Hornets were going to invest into Miles Bridges, there were questions swirling around his maturity in terms of how that play-in game ended when he threw his headband and and hit a, a, a woman in the stands. And from the pictures that he was posting on social media of uh, what, what a lot of people thought was, uh, you, you know, some kind of, uh, I don't know, there was a, it looked like a blunt. Lean in a joint. Is Lean what in a joint. Speculate. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were all of these questions already swirling uh, around that. And, and so, you know, that's that's that that has to be packaged into this conversation as well, uh, because, you, you know, I, I think it, it will be interesting, too, on the length of the contract. You know, I think is, is this a situation where Miles comes back uh, to Charlotte, but maybe it's on a one year deal, maybe it's on a two year deal. Uh, yeah, well, I, a lot, so many questions at this point. Uh, uh, but at the same time, from Cupshack's conversation there, I really do feel like the Hornets I haven't been moved off my position that the Hornets are, are going to do uh, every well, not everything they can, but they are going to pursue Miles Bridges in, to bring in as back. much a fashion yeah. as they were going to before. Yeah, they're, they're going to look to bring him back. The last couple of things I'll say, too, is you know the lottery plays a big part in this. If you get the number one pick and you get Victor Webinyama, does that allow you to move on from Miles a little more easily? Do, do, wh- which way do you go on that? Do you view, okay, man, we can be an awesome team, we're going to get Victor, and we'll just go ahead and pay Miles and have all the talent as much as we can get, hoping that he plays this year. This is from the Hornets' standpoint. Do you do you view it as that, or do you view it as letting Miles walk because now we have women Yama to balance the scales and even more so for the long term? What which which way do you go on that? And that's going to be a really interesting discussion point within the Hornets organization. Yeah, because getting women Yama is going to create roster problems for you in terms of like who do you sit. Um, but you'd much rather have that. Uh, to me, I'd much rather have that roster problem with a women Yama than I would a Miles Bridges. A lot of comments oh, yeah. about. I, th- I think a lot of people overestimate what Miles c- could possibly bring to this team on on the floor. Because I think I think there are serious questions about a player that hasn't played for this length of time coming back. Can he contribute in the same way? Uh, but with a Victor Webinyama, I, I don't think there are any of those concerns. Uh, you know what? I have not looked at his basketball reference page in a long time. And it's crazy. I just typed it in because you were talking about some of this, like just him as a player. I just was typing it in. And with this new computer, it does not show up as a previously visited site. Like, and I've had this for a while. <laughs> just nuts, man. It's just how it is. He hadn't played yeah. basketball. I haven't been thinking about him at all from a basketball standpoint. All right, let's move on. A couple more segments to go. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Just played some Mitch Kupchak audio. We have Steve Clifford audio for you on the other side of the break. But this episode is brought to you by eBay. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, 
you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to the My Garage tab and then look for the green check to know the part will fit or you get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts and the right fit and the right prices, all of that on eBay ebaymotors.com let's ride eligible items only exclusions apply a little russell wilson thing for you in there two more segments to go locked on hornets is locked on hornets adam silver had ahmad rashad up on stage and he used his phone to like body scan ahmad rashad and then they like inserted a like a digital version of ahmad rashad into the highlight and so i'm looking at this and going just fix my league pass. I don't want to be in a highlight. I would just like to actually watch the highlight without my application logging me out, freezing, dropping all of the time. Fix my league pass before you insert me in the game, please and thank you. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, we heard from Steve Clifford a couple of times over, you know, certainly speaking about the younger players over the last week because they've been getting a ton of run over more than the last week, really the last 10 games of the season. He spoke about the last 20 games of the season, making sure that you don't react too crazily so just evaluating that last part. Here's the exact quote from the Hornets head coach. You have to be careful about these last 20 games of the season. There are more organizations over the years that make mistakes because you get guys that play well. And let's, they're not meaningless games for the players, but they're not the same as playing as if you're playing to try to get in. All right, before we do this guessing game, before we do the whole guessing, trying to figure out who he's talking about. Who's he talking you know, about? You know what this reminded me, though, of? Okay. It reminded me of the Charlotte Hornets season last year and what Mitch Kupchak had to say about it. Because that's exactly what Mitch said about not being too high on yourself when discussing the Hornets having reached the four seed at one at one point in the middle of the season. And that you can't take that as gospel. Okay, this is what our team really looks like. And you have to be careful of not getting too high. And so then Mitch Kupchak afterwards says, well, look, we could do nothing and then really improve. Right. And then he <laughs> acknowledged that in this media session. Oh, you know, man. he acknowledged it again. Um, but that's, I, I, I like it. It's refreshing then. Like, it's funny in the middle of that season, or I, I guess that season's end when Mitch Kupchak said that, that was a refreshing comment to me. It was like, okay, yes, you, you understand that this is not the roster you need to go forth with. And then he said the whole, well, we'll probably just improve anyway. And then that was a little, that was scary, but I, it's refreshing here too, with Steve Clifford saying he's not. He, he, this is not camouflage, right? Like he sees it for what it is. It fresh legs, baby bees coming in, you know, don't have the film. Don't, people don't exactly know about some of the guys that are getting all this run. And also, you know, it's, it, it's nice to see like that you're playing Dallas and OKC and Dallas is, you know, tanking hard, not on purpose, but you get the idea. So I did like this comment from Steve Clifford. It was very self-aware. Yeah, because it's dangerous for an organization to overestimate that that last those last twenty games. Not just for the Hornets, but you know some of these uh, free agents, unrestricted or otherwise, that the Hornets are going to be uh, dealing with, and other teams will have a chance to deal with as well in free agency. Do you look at those last twenty games and go, "Wow, look at what they did! They could do that for my team." And Clifford goes on to talk about this, like you know, bringing bringing players into an organization that played well during this tank time. And then you get them with other really good players and you go try to win a playoff or you try to get into the playoffs. And then all of a sudden they can't put up those numbers anymore. And you go, oh, man, they really took a step back. It's like, no, they didn't take a step back. They're just playing in vastly different circumstances. Yeah. And so, you know, and getting more shots. Like, I mean, I, I think that's the thing with Speed Mikhailuk. He played well, like in limited minutes with limited shots. He did some nice things for the team when he was playing with some of the veterans. So I don't want to take all of all of this away from him. But at the same time, we have to be careful and say, all right, you know, all those threes that he was knocking down, he, he was shooting a lot of shots. He was getting into a rhythm. But that's not going to be his role if there aren't seven or eight major rotation pieces out of the lineup, right? And so you can't, you know, and so I think Sfee might be one of those players he's talking about. 
um, but also with the uh, with the, some of the young guys as well. Well, yeah, I mean, Doug, you the, there's one name that comes to mind more than any, you know, especially when okay. he's talking about the last 20 games, what they represent. You know, we saw James Booknight get an extra mm-hmm. opportunity, and he went for 20 points a couple of times. And it would be one thing if we just took this comment and tried to attribute that to some player. Yeah. But Steve Clifford's given some, you talk about camouflage, maybe some hidden comments about James Booknight over the last, what, month of the regular season or so to the season's completion with uh, end-of-season media availability. There, there's been a couple that you could easily apply to James Booknight. I have to imagine that's the first name on your mind. I think book night, but look, I've been super high on Bryce McGowan's, but I would apply it to Bryce too, because you have to be, I, I think part of this is about patience is, is not evaluating Bryce on two games at the end of the season that were, I mean, that Cleveland game was super meaningless because Cleveland uh, went deep into their bench as well. And so you look at those games and you go, okay, that's nice, but it doesn't mean that Bryce, you know, needs to become the sixth man next year and needs to get 15 shots. That's he's not ready for that. Not on a team yeah. that's looking to compete, right? And to get get into the playoffs because it is it's just different. And what I love about Steve Clifford and, and where I think this makes him that he's a contrast to James Borrego is I think that Clifford understands that winning in the regular season is not winning in the playoffs. It's just two different ball games. You're getting a look at it right now in the play-in. The Hornets got a great look at it when they tried to get in the play-in and got mud stomped twice. But uh, but that's just a play-in. Then you get into a seven-game series, and that's a whole other bag of beans. And so Clifford understands that, and he understands that like the regular season is about winning games for sure, but it's also about building a team philosophy that can actually go win – when the games completely change in terms of the defensive intensity, in terms yeah. of the shot making, it all changes. You know, shots that you were getting in the regular season all of a sudden completely disappear. And it's what makes players like Gordon Hayward. It's what I think will make Bryce McGowan's a super valuable player two, three years from now. But the mistake you make, the mistake that some organizations make, is to look at that and go, okay, now that guy's ready for like 20 minutes right now. No, I, I hear you. It doesn't mean that Steve Clifford wasn't referring to him, but also if he was, it, I Steve Clifford talked about Bryce McGowan's glowingly, and then even I had a sit-down interview with him as well, and I said, who was the guy that made the biggest improvement from the beginning of the season to the end? And he said, yeah, Bryce McGowan's is one. That was a that was a nice surprise. He was smiling. That was a pleasant surprise to see Bryce McGowan's. He would also mention P.J., Nick Richards, clearly Mark Williams with what he was able to do. And so it, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means you don't hear James Booknight in that conversation, right? You, you don't, when, when you hear Steve Clifford say it's okay to go for 22 points, but you got to defend. And then you look at the box score and there's James Booknight having scored. What do you know? Exactly 22 points. The number that Steve Clifford mentioned that I just, it's why I'm sure Book Night fans are mad. I'm I'm literally relaying the message that is pretty easy to transcribe from what Steve Clifford is telling you. Well, I would just say to to counter your point a little bit, I wouldn't necessarily say that Book Night played extremely well in these last twenty. Games. I had a couple of that's good also games, fair. No, no, but like you're right. it's not you're, like that's, that's because totally we said at the yeah. beginning of this period that Book Night had an opportunity to open our eyes, but it was going to take something pretty meaningful, consistently good play to open our eyes. And and I thought for just a second, my eyes were like, it, it's like when you're trying to wake up and you don't want to fully open your eyes because it's too bright. They were like just a little bit open. And then it went back closed again. It was an, it was enough to at least see this thing through a little bit more. It, it oh, was for enough sure, to, for sure. But th- that's no, not what Clifford's saying. Clifford's saying, Clifford's saying yeah. don't make the mistake of taking a couple of games or even 20 games and evaluating that and saying, okay, now we're willing to really fully invest, whether that means more mm-hmm. minutes or a longer contract or more money or whatever it is. But honestly, I do, uh, going back to the beginning of this conversation, I do think a little bit of this is about Svee McIluke um, in that, you know, you don't want to give this guy, if they can find a way to bring him back for like a year or something, if they feel like he could be a good 13th, 14th piece, then fine. But, you know, I think there, there could be a team that comes along in free agency and says, oh, look at Svi scorching here at the end of this season. You know, you don't want to get in a bidding war with that kind of team. You let, no. let Svi Mikhailu go get a three-year deal with Detroit or whatever. 
Uh, he might have already played for Detroit. I don't know. <laughs> he did. He did. Okay, he great. <laughs> so don't make yeah, that mistake again, Detroit. <laughs> they want him back. Uh, yeah, you're down bad if you are in a bidding war. I'm sorry, Svee. You did. You helped us out, man. S U S V. Yeah, S U S V. We'll always remember you. We will remember you finally. All right, let's get to the last segment. Coming up next on Locked On Hornets. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Let's dissect a couple of other Steve Clifford comments that we have in the bank. Uh, a few more things he had to say during his media session. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Grand slams, no hitters, double plays. They're all back, and there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Oh, buddy, when I was a baseball addict, I was on FanDuel every single day. Were you, comb- you, were you combing through it? I was combing through it. I was dissecting it. And uh, I was going right through it, baby, 100%. That's because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up today and place your first bet and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. So don't miss your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel official partner of Major League Baseball. One more segment to go. Locked on Hornets. This is Locked on Hornets. You know, Golden State spent almost a minuscule amount of time with zero of their starters out on the floor. They had at least one out there the entire you just time. Have four Hall of Famers. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and so you just you put just them have, anywhere. You just have one out Stack there. Stack them up. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. All right, Doug, let's get to the last couple of comments here from Steve Clifford. He was talking about defense and in particular, LaMelo Ball. He did say that LaMelo played a lot better. But if you wanted to do the whole what player is he talking about thing, here's another comment for you. Quote, just guarding the ball got a lot better as the season went on and we were bad at it earlier in the year. I got I got I got it. got it. If you want to to hear from the man. Oh, okay, I do want to hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. Please. Let's hear from Steve Clifford. Just guarding the ball got a lot better as the season went on and we were bad at it early in the year. And again, the way people are playing now, if you can't guard your guy a little bit better be like 25 a night, because you know, you're going to watch now in these playoff series, you guys know this. If you can't be a regular season team, this league's all about winning in the playoffs. Right. And guys that can't guard their man. Now we're five out, four out, one in It crushes you. It doesn't matter how smart they are. So if you're not going to be able to guard your guy, like, you better be terrific offensively. So there he is talking about defense more so. When I talked to him, he said the same thing. And he really, actually, when I talked to him, he he really spoke to point of attack defense. Like, if you get beat off of the first dribble, then everything goes haywire and you're done. Mm-hmm. And so they got a lot better at that as the season went on, too. What did you make of that comment? Yeah, they got, they got better at recovering, right? I mean, you saw it, uh, especially in those last 20 games, particularly that unit seem to be able to really like stay on top of things and rotate. Um, and, you know, all of I think all of the problems of the baby bees were off of the offensive variety and, and any high scores that they allowed were due to the fact that they could not play offense. And, you know, I think you could extend that to the rest of the team when LaMelo wasn't on the floor. The, when the offense is bad, you're missing a lot of shots and that would not typically be a problem for your defense in years past but as the game has gotten so fast teams are attacking off of misses particularly long misses bad misses teams will attack you in transition and uh so that is going to hurt your defense but also turnovers i mean the baby bees were turnover prone but at times this season even the veterans uh were turning the basketball over not really focused and, and that's going to kill your defense as well. Um, so offensive problems leaked into the defense. But in terms of this particular quote, when he talks about, you know, if you can't guard your guy a little, you better be like 25 a night. This isn't some new philosophy from Steve Clifford. Like he's no. definitely changed how he views the game. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't coach the same way that he was coaching when he was coaching Kimba Walker and Nick Batum. Like he understands the game's changed. But this philosophy hasn't changed for him. Uh, he's talking about James Harden here, you know, like if if you can't guard your guy a little, you got to be a world class scorer. And on this team, you know, I think you could look at a guy like James Book Knight and say, you can't. And 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 I sort of compare him to Malik Monk in this way. Like, if you're not going to come out and knock down a bunch of threes consistently every night, then it's hard to play you 
because we know about the the negatives. And if we know about it, you know, NBA scouts are everywhere. It's you can get into the building pretty easily and look at the game and go, okay, that guy can't guard his guy at all. So we're going to attack it. And especially early in the season, I thought book Knight's defense got better when he got that second chance. But early in the season, I remember a game against Washington and it was book night against Beal. And they were just like, Beal, well, yeah. Beal, switch, switch, pick and roll, pick and roll. Like they knew it and they were going after him and it was disheartening. And you could see it on Book Knight's face. Like he didn't seem like he enjoyed playing basketball all that much this season. But on the but when they were attacking him, it, it was it was killing him. Well, and and you mentioned just the James Harden example. And you know, it's it's not exactly you can't directly apply it to Lamelo because Lamelo is not scoring twenty five a night. But I do think Steve Clifford views that as well as with Lamelo because think about Steve Clifford back in the day if he was treating Lamelo as if he was Kimba Walker or at least the way that he was, you know, what five six years ago, then it might be a little bit different. Steve Clifford would be a little more frustrated with his star player. But Lamelo's twenty points a game. He's shooting really well from three. He's taken deep three bombs too, by the way. And you know what? He's facilitating at a crazy level where the offense is bonkers when he's out there on the floor. Yeah. And so I think Steve Clifford th- that that is an example within itself. It's not oh give Steve Clifford James Harden and he backs off of it. No, he's he has Lamelo ball and he does back off of it. Th- this is the example that you see offensive special player with Lamelo where the numbers are through the roof. He's cool with it. it it's yeah. just you hope everybody around him gets better defensively. It doesn't mean he's cool with not improving. It doesn't mean that he's cool with Lamelo not improving on that end. Yeah. But he knows, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna ride Lamelo thirty five minutes a night, even if defensively the numbers are a lot worse with him on the floor. Well, yeah, because even if he's not scoring twenty five a night, he's yeah, responsible he's, for thirty five to forty points a night, right? Because of his passing right. ability, and, and also I think Clifford understands. The, and LaMelo understands, too, that he's one tweak in his game away from being able to score 25 a night on the regular and and to score 40 every once in a while. And that tweak is get stronger, as Cupcheck said, get stronger, get to the rim. All these guys are talking about the same thing because they all know it's true. Like, he's got to get stronger. He's got to get to the rim. He's got to get fouled. And that's how you accumulate uh, those, those few extra points. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I think that's why – you're going to see, you know, again, if Clifford stays, if the, if the team sale doesn't happen and or if the team sale does happen and they keep Clifford, I think you will see small improvements in LaMelo's defense. I don't expect him to you know, be in contention for, you know, an all defense team or anything like that. You'll see some small improvements, but ultimately that's not the guy you're worried about. It is, um, you know, it is some of these bench players who. And guys, you know, coming through in the draft these days, I feel like it's there are a lot of guys that um, are, you know, looking to score exclusively, not really worried about the defensive end or, or have trouble making the leap from college where you're not playing defense for the entire possession. Whereas in the NBA, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to challenge you defensively through the entire possession. And they're they're exclusively focused on offense, and then you come to the league at 19, 20 years old, and you go, "Oh, I can't score like I I could score, and I can't play defense." Now it's a problem. All right, that'll do it. We are done combing through the audio today. We've got one more day of combing to go through at least this week. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That's also uh, that also is true for game to game NBA. Make that your second listen every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked on game to game covers every game from across the league with local analysis that only locked on can deliver. Follow game to game on locked on NBA available on the Odyssey app, YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. 